of chicken. You have to, to survive. You just listen to Elon Musk in any of his stories about where the world's going to be in 10 years, and you'll know that we'll be working in space. It will take us a half an hour to get from New York to LA. <laughs> and what else? I mean, it could be anything. They're printing body parts with 3D printers. You know, hands that work for $700. This is, these are world-changing events. The world is changing so rapidly, you can't even deny that. You're gonna have to become a dancer. My name is Dennis Patricia, and I'm the Question Master from Road to Employment. I'm traveling across Canada to find the best employment advice for students and young professionals. Today, I had a chance to sit down with Lee Tao, the founder and CEO of Chatter High, to talk to him about his career journey and the lessons he's learned. CEO of Chatter High. It's very exciting. Good to see you. Thank you. Glad you guys are here. So you have a really interesting road to employment. Can you tell us a little bit about your career journey? Sure thing, Dennis. I, when I was in grade two, I was at my uncle's wedding and I met a guy who was a paleontologist and I must have said, I love dinosaurs. And he sent me an actual dinosaur bone. I got it in the mail with paperwork uh, and I was completely hooked. I wanted to be a paleontologist right through to grade 12. Now, I grew up in Ontario and we had grade 13 back then, and I played a lot of sports. And McGill University in Montreal recruited me to be quarterback for their football team. And what they do is they fly the recruits out to Montreal, they pair you up with a fourth year student who takes you out in the town for the weekend because Montreal is fun, uh, and then they march you to the empty stadium on the Monday. And then the legendary coach at the time, his name is Charlie Bailey, he briefed all the recruits like you were on his football team, and I was totally sold. I wanted to go to McGill really badly. And then I figured out that this great, big, prestigious, 190-year-old Canadian university does not have paleontology. And I was devastated. because must have been so shocking. Yeah, for 10 years I've had this focus and somehow I missed the fact that not all universities have all the ologies. I go home to Peterborough, my mom's a college professor, and I go and complain to my parents and she says, calm down. <laughs> there are other universities, there are other provinces, go take a look around. My mom was really involved. She was giving me these little bits of advice and she was the one that found out about a bus going from Peterborough to Kingston, which is a two hour drive, to check out this university called RMC. And that came out of completely out of the place. I don't know where she got that from, right? And so I'm asking her, what is RMC? And she says, Royal Military College. I go like, was I a bad child? <laughs> I know how to make my bed. Where does that come from? You know? Um, and then she tells me that, uh, because I knew I had to pay my own way to university, mm -hmm. then she tells me that, no, no, no. If you can get into RMC, it's a $100,000 scholarship. All right, I'll, uh, I'll go check it out. So I get on the bus, we drive for two hours down to Kingston, and we pick up people along the way, and I don't know anybody in the bus, right? And we're all dressed like you guys, normal high school kids, which means we stick out like a sore thumb at the military college, because they all wear uniforms. So they know exactly who we are. All the high school kids are here to check it out. We were in the parking lot for four mil minutes, and we're sort of milling about there, and this row of first year university students comes marching past us. Now they've only been there for six weeks. They've got short hair, white t-shirts, gray shorts, uh, they look really tired and really pissed off. And this is what happens. So we're all standing over there in the parking lot, and this row of first year students comes by and does this. This one guy in the middle goes, Don't do it! <laughs> and I remember that kind of freaked me out a bit, but went on the tour and, of course, discovered that it's an amazing university, really well financed. Uh, everyone there is an athlete, mm -hmm. and of course, they pay you to go there. So I decided I should apply. I go back to the recruiting center in Peterborough. And I walk in and I'm like Ross from Friends, right? I'm like, hi, there's a sergeant sitting there or something. And, hi, I'm Lee, I wanna be a paleontologist. What do you got? And he looks at me and says, son, we don't dig up dinosaurs in the military. <laughs> but we do have a double major in oceanography and space science. The only undergraduate degree of its kind in Canada at the military college in Victoria, British Columbia. And the honest truth is I had no idea what I was getting into. I didn't research it well. Um, I liked the degree, the degree attracted me, and I joined, you had to sign up, you mm -hmm. know, this 14 year contract, and I really didn't know what I was getting into, because I was never in cadets or anything. Mm -hmm. um, but I actually discovered that I loved it, because it was all based on teamwork, and it was very challenging. Yeah. And so, I did the four year program at Royal Roads, you know, sort of finding out what it was all about as we went, and while I was there, I got to meet the Queen, I got to be in the Commonwealth Games in 1994. I got to, as, as a, a guest, to greet the athletes in the Athletes' Village. I got to work in the Arctic, so yeah. 
you know, and then I graduated and I had a job. I've been in the forces now for 24 years. I'm a lieutenant in the Navy. I was reg force for 10 years, now I'm a reservist. I didn't know you could work part-time in our military. I've sailed around the world twice. I've done two tours in the Middle East and the Persian Gulf. When I'm on the bridge of the ship, I legally have charge of the ship. At two in the morning, I happen to be on watch, and there it is, and Challenger Deep is just south of us. Challenger Deep is the deepest place on Earth, 11.3 kilometers. Okay? You could turn Everest upside down and hide it in there, and no one would know it's there. <laughs> this is outer space for me, right, an oceanographer. So at two in the morning, I, I had to do it. I turned the ship south, port 30, headed south, sailed over Challenger Deep, ran out to the bridge wing, threw a nickel into the ocean, took a selfie, which back in 99 took six months to develop, by the way. <laughs> and then I brought the ship back on course, right? Thinking, nobody knows what I just did. And of course, the captain knows all, even in his sleep. So the next morning, he calls me, he's like, Lee, why? <laughs> That's what they do, and you just spill the beans. I ate too much dessert, I don't know, what are you asking? You tell them everything. And then I said, sir, I wanted to throw a nickel in the Challenger Deep. I said, why? <laughs> and I go, there is a Canadian nickel at the bottom of the earth, and I got to put it there. And I think that's cool, right? And he's just like, just go, just go, right? And the whole point of that is, you have no idea what you're going to be able to do in your life, right? Climb Everest and leave a quarter. That's my next plan, right? You've got to one-up There's inflation, um, right? And so crazy things are going to happen from what you thought. Growing up in a place like Peterborough, Ontario, dreaming of being a paleontologist. You know what I mean? Even in grade 12, my whole life has turned out different. And in the year 2000, I decided uh, that was enough traveling the world, and so I transferred to the reserves, and I got hired by the biggest company in the planet at the time, which was GE. So this is, uh, this is where I hung my hat for five years, from 2000 to 2005. Yep. Uh, shiny red locomotives, who doesn't like that? And I, I learned a lot. <laughs> I had to learn to deal with a lot of difficult people. To get that job at the facility, you were supposed to have a master's degree in mechanical or electrical engineering, which I didn't have. I have a double major in science. So how in the world did you find yourself in that job then? Uh, well, that was really... I had put 900 applications into the job market in Vancouver in the year 2000, all for IT-type jobs, and I got zero replies. But, you know, it's kind of who you know. And so through someone else from the Navy who had gotten work with GE, that's how I got connected. Um, and GE is one of those companies that says, yes, you're supposed to have that master's degree or we'll accept your experience as an officer or a senior NCM. They saw me as adaptable. So whatever you did behind the black curtain over there, that's going to allow you to figure this out. And that did happen. It really, really worked well. How many people have buildings named after them while they're still alive? This one's mine. This is the dry dock. <laughs> and I mean, Good thing because I then went on to figure out this new industry called digital out of home, and now I'm an ed tech CEO yeah. you know, in a startup phase, and I've had to learn how to do this. So, so I've become adaptable. Lee had an absolutely fascinating career journey. He's been in the Navy, worked for GE, did digital out of home marketing, and even started his own company. So, how did he transition between all these different industries? It boils down to adaptability. That's what Lee told us about now, you know, transitioning from one completely separate topic to another one. And so I really wanted to find out, you know, how did he learn that adaptability? And how did school play a role in that? How many of you guys have been in a class in a school and the teacher's teaching you something? And in your mind you're going, when am I ever going to do this again? Like, when am I ever going to use this in life? Oh, come on, it happens, like, yeah, so there we go, yeah. It happens all the time, right? You know, calculus. You learn how to do derivatives. You're not going to drive down a highway and look at that arched bridge and go, man, I'm going to drive that sucker. Okay, let's figure out the area under that curve. And the truth is, we get taught all sorts of things that you're never actually going to do again. Right? That's not why we're in school. We don't graduate and roll out the parchment and say, look at all the things that I can do. I can take derivatives. I can do calculus. I can yeah. do calculus. I can do nomenclature. My chemistry teacher in grade 11, Mr. Keene, awesome teacher, he was also a volleyball, British guy. He was always like pulling pistols out of his hip and kept us on our edge, right? So I was bought in. That teacher had a pattern for teaching us nomenclature and somehow I was able to figure it out. I was motivated because I wanted to be a paleontologist and I needed my scholarship, so I had to put my hand up and ask the right questions and figure it out. And in that moment, when you figure out nomenclature, you actually just become a little bit more adaptable that day. I exercised this muscle in my head, and that's the only way you become adaptable is by learning how to learn, by figuring out stuff. The more stuff you figure out, the more stuff you can figure out. Does that make sense to you? It totally is obvious to me, looking back, because my careers have done massive shifts 
every single time. I've had to go and figure stuff out, figure out industries that didn't exist. And the only reason that happened was I was adaptable. And I think that that happened because I learned how to learn going through school. In school, the reason we do this stuff for education as young as possible now is because if we can get you engaged, if you find something that is of interest to you, I want to be a paleontologist. I want to take the brewmaster program at Olds College because beer is the fastest growing industry, right? You may not have known that program existed, but if you find out that it does, and all of a sudden you're like, yes, okay? Do you start getting engaged in school? Yeah, if you've if you bought in, the lights come on, right, and you go for it, then I think that's when good things start. That's when school starts, in my opinion. If you believe that that path you can follow, you can do it, and you believe that that's a goal you can reach, you know what that is? That's hope. That is the single biggest predictor of your academic achievement. That's what the studies show. It's bigger than your grades to date, guys. It's bigger than your intelligence and your personality. The beauty of hope is that it's available to anybody. You can live in a garage with your parents. Right, and have no money, and you can still have hope. And so our piece of the puzzle with Chatter High is simply, what is out there? Did you know? You know, let's explore some of these programs. And, and it's interesting because when I'm in the class, I ask kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? And what do you hear most often? I don't know. Oh, good talk, all right, catch you next year, all right? <laughs> the other half say the jobs they learned about in Curious George. Teacher, doctor, lawyer, accountant, fireman, nurse, police, yeah, right? People aren't aware of the incredible number of programs that exist. I kind of just went and studied what what I found interesting and didn't give much thought to how that would help me um, in terms of career path. I never really thought much beyond kind of school. So I did school for school's sake. Just kind of went in on general studies because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I stayed at university for the first semester, for that um, winter semester, for that fall semester. And at the start of it I had five courses and at the end of that semester I had one. Uh, I dropped all my courses. I was frustrated because I I felt like I was wasting my time. I kind of slacked off in my grade 12 years so I was like, okay, I have to actually do work. And I almost dropped out in first semester, after first semester, but I stuck with it. My brother kind of mentored me. It took about a year and a half of mindless studying and majoring in pool most of the time to realize that this isn't for me. And it took a lot of like development of just experiencing different things before I realized university is just not my game. It's not inspiring to anything I'm passionate about. I don't even know why I'm here. And so a lot of that comes back to what did they do to research these things ahead of time? And did they know about the hundreds of programs that are available? Uh, so really, uh, Chatter High is helping them explore those options, which then leads to an interest. Uh, and the counselors and the schools have all sorts of tools to help a student once they've expressed an interest. Uh, so we really want to help them get interested and find out what's out there. So the one key takeaway, guys, you have to start exploring because by exploring, you will find that thing you want to get engaged in. And once you do, you're gonna learn how to learn just by naturally being involved in something that you love to do. And as you're learning to learn, you become more adaptable. And that is what's gonna make you successful in this fast-paced, changing world.